Hi, Katie and Willie, back here for part two. We'll try to be a little more concise in our answers this time, and uh, we're excited to get through your questions here. It's Again, it's, a, it's passionate because we're excited about this, so sorry if that first segment was a little long, but we're excited to talk to you about the next one. So, was there some sort of event that happened in your life that you guys decided to grow your own food and live quite sustainably? Um, you know, it's probably just both our upbringings. We both spent a lot of our time outside. Both our parents, families kind of had gardens a little bit. But I'd say the thing that made us do it together was um, very early on in mine and Katie's relationship, we both love to travel, and it's a huge part of our life. So we were like, let's travel. Let's go to South America. We're going to do wolfing, willing workers on organic farms down in South America. It was a relatively new thing down there. There's like, what, five farms at the time? I think five in Chile and three in Argentina. <laughs> so there <whatever>. wasn't many. <laughs> and uh, I, I think we hit them all in uh, Argentina at the time. But we went and we traveled down there to work on these farms. And like that really made us kind of rethink like everything is like, wow, we can do this. And we were like, we're going to do a wolf farm back in the area. And that Katie <laughs> talked about that in the previous segment. But like now we really feel like this is where our passion and, you know, we can pass our knowledge on is like what you can do in small areas within cities because most of the people in the country live in a city now. Mm -hmm. um, so we're excited. That's, that's probably what got us going on it. What is your biggest challenge that comes from growing your own food? I would say the biggest challenge is that there are certain parts of the season where you everything's coming at one time and the days are hot and you need to water your plants um, and really attend to them. So that gives you two options. You either can't leave or you need to have somebody who can come and help you with your garden. So I think one of the biggest things that we've always valued and that it has continued to be um, an important part of our life is building those relationships within the community or building relationships with your neighbors. Um, so we're very fortunate. We have amazing neighbors who we've built relationships with over the last decade, and it's a back and forth. So when we leave, we know that our neighbor is willing to watch our chickens, which is not something everybody's willing to do. Um, but she keeps an eye on our chickens. Our other neighbor is willing to water our plants, and then in turn, um, we're able to do stuff for them when they need to leave. So I think a huge part is that you have to build relationships um, because otherwise it's really hard to do everything on your own through the whole year. Did you add anything to that? No, I think that's it. All right, so next question. How difficult is it to start this lifestyle? I'm in college, so I don't have an abundance of resources to start my own garden. What tips do you have on starting this sort of lifestyle? Again, is it difficult? Um... It's more of like a mental thing. It's like a, that's really what it is. Like I love it. It's very relaxing for me. Like it's a it's a good workout being in a garden, moving mm -hmm. around. Um, mental state like mindfulness is like pulling weeds out of your garden is incredibly mindful. It's, you know, filled for myself. Um, I really enjoy it after a hard day of work or if I have to spend time in our home office here during the day. Like man, more do I love like going out <laughs> and pulling some weeds in the garden. But really, it's just like a it's just changing your mindset um uh, you know not having the resources to start your own garden again like community gardens man you can learn so much and the people there are super passionate about teaching about it and it's really helpful i mean thirty thousand pounds of produce comes from the cane street community garden it's incredible um so yeah those you know just try it a little bit you know start by just buying herbs you know, having in your, you know, you can even have those in your dorm room. You know, you get a little LED grow light. Um, they make super small ones now. Um, but yeah, it's, and it, it's a, a nice, it's just quality of life. I would just say to add to that, um, again, we don't spend a lot on our garden. Uh, like I said, we save our seeds. If you go to the community garden, say you wanted to um, plant garlic in the fall. If you go to the community garden, they'll send you home with garlic that you can plant yourself. So it's not something where you have to spend a lot of money. You can go to the city and they have soil. They have wood chips if you want to put wood chips down. All of that is free. Um, so that piece of it is really not costly. Um, and I'd say as for starting it, start small. I think that's the thing that Willie and I emphasize most is it can be easy to get overwhelmed by all the things that you could do that you want to do. Um, but start small. Like he said, he started with tomatoes, herbs, traveling in his Subaru on the East Coast, you know. Then we started with a small garden. And 
what we have here didn't happen overnight. We added little things each year. One of the biggest things we did is we didn't add something until we had a routine and system for what we had previously done. Um, the last thing you want to do is overwhelm yourself. Make sure it's restorative, like Willie said. Um, they always say gardening can help extend your lifespan because you're outside, you're digging in the dirt, it can be meditative. Um, so just start small. Do what feels good to mm -hmm. you and look at some of those community resources so that you don't have to spend your own. You don't have to go and buy everything new from a store. So, all right, next question. Um, what advice do you have for someone who is just starting off with sustainable living? What are the best routes to take to begin living a sustainable life? What do you think the hardest part is to transitioning to this lifestyle? So this is really pretty much a, you know, a similar question, just worded a little bit differently than we asked before. Um, again, like Katie said, and I've said before, is start small. Just mm -hmm. start with something simple. Um, and then look what's important to you. You know, maybe it's not about like growing your own food. Maybe you want to make sure everything that you wear is sustainable as far as like clothes wise. People get into that. We have a really good friend, Conscious Chatter, Kestrel Jenkins. He does really great stuff on sustainable fashion. And that's where her passion is. Um, so it's just like, you know, start small. And then it's incredibly addicting because then you can get really deep in the sustainability <laughs> style of like your life and what you could do to be more sustainable. And then it almost becomes like, you know, conversations that we have of like, what can we do differently? Like talking to like these classes for years now like we learn stuff from these classes and like stretch our mind and try to like no we can do that better so there's always things that you can like challenge and do better it's just like start small and just start with like little things and working in that mm -hmm. um and like willie said like pick something that you're you're passionate about and one of the biggest things i think for us is um you don't need a ton in life. Um, so I think one of the mental shifts is just to think about what do I really need, want, you know, do I need to burn through 20 pairs of jeans a year? No, especially when you think about the impact of what manufacturing jeans does to the environment. You know, like he said, take one thing, try to shift that, and then just think about the impact. So it's a mental shift, and then it's just, again, not the worst thing you can do is overburden yourself and stress yourself so that it becomes not enjoyable. Um, challenge yourself, but don't stress yourself out. What are the best gardening tips you have in order to create your own produce? What specific tips do you have for college students who might not have space, money, or time associated with gardening? And what are your favorite and easiest or easiest plants in the garden? Okay. Um, Gardening tips to create your own produce, like don't overplant. It's really easy to like, oh my gosh, I have so many tomatoes, plant too many. Well, they're <laughs> not going to produce a lot then if you would, like plant too many of them. So like really look at the spacing guidelines. Like these are because people have been gardening and doing stuff for years and years. Like these are people are pretty set and they're pretty good. Like you can challenge them and stuff like that and trying to stretch tomatoes out, you know, further up top. But like really like that's you know that those are some of the things specific tips you have for college students who might not have space or money or time associated with gardening um again like i said earlier five gallon buckets are pretty awesome um you can do a lot with uh with them um you might even be able to put a rain barrel you know at your rental unit to be able to mm -hmm. kind of collect some of the water so you're not having to worry about using that and i mean one 55 gallon rain barrel would be able to do a lot of water and again you gotta be careful you make sure look at the roof that you have it's an old college and roof that hasn't been replaced in a long time probably don't want to collect the rain water off it get some little arsenic in you and that wouldn't be good um and again like willie said before community gardens community gardens community gardens uh cane street garden you go and volunteer for a few minutes and you are going to have enough produce for your entire week week after week after week they give away so much produce um so definitely check them out favorite and easiest plants to garden i mean it's kind of pretty obvious we both love tomatoes <laughs> um and then basil also like the combination of them is just awesome so like they're both really easy to grow like um, on the tomatoes, you know, make sure you 
pinch off all the little suckers on there. Might be able to put a link on the bottom of this video of kind of a pruning tomato plants. But like, go to the community gardens, like Katie said. There's a lot of people that will teach you a lot of awesome stuff. Mm -hmm. All right. What are some of your favorite stories in regards to what Great Lakes Trail Builders has accomplished so far? That's a question for you, Willie. Um, yeah. Jeez. Oh, um, favorite stories. I, I mean, ultimately, one, like, I feel like I've been able to be a kid my entire life. <laughs> um, I get to play in the dirt. <laughs> like, my mom told me to play in the dirt, um, which probably led to where I'm at. Like, I don't know. It's just... I, Katie was doing a talk at a sustainability event at the UW of Madison. She was talking about sustainability in the workplace uh, when she was working at Quirk Trip. Um, and they had uh, the delegate delegation from Bhutan there. And they were talking about uh, gross national happiness, which is really something neat to look into a scale that Bhutan came up with or considered the happiest place on the planet. Well, nonetheless, afterwards, they had a little meet and greet. I went up and talked to the guy and told him what I did. And he's like, oh, man, we have trails in Bhutan. We could really, you should, we should figure something out and you should come over. And that was just, you know, had a, had a conversation with someone at a meet and greet after an event. And uh, a year later, it led to me and Katie going to do some consulting for the government of Bhutan on their trails around their power plants and throughout the country. And Man, that was an awesome experience. Like, me and Katie still talk about it, and hopefully we'll be able to get back to it um, and be able to do something with them in the future. But, like, what a memorable experience. Um, I don't know. It's, you know, whether it's different animal encounters that I've had throughout <laughs> life or, like, you know, my, my you know, tent getting hit by rock storms or by bears or, like, Lots of different things. It's like always an adventure. I'm kind of addicted to it. Um, I really like being in the elements um, and making in my body being uncomfortable at points. And, you know, I've talked about a lot with this with Katie recently, and I really thrive on that. So, um, and I'm just, you know, I'm super happy of everything that Great Lakes Trail Builders accomplished. I started a nonprofit conservation course, super proud of that too. Um, so a lot of stuff that we've done, we've started our own company, Great Lakes Sustainability. So a lot of things, but I mean, it's all those fun things. I mean, you know, I, there are plenty more stories to come. <laughs> <laughs> I'll share one more from being in Bhutan. We were out on a, on a spot that they wanted to build a trail and they sent along a search and rescue team with us, which thought was a little interesting, you know, wondering what we were getting into. Um, so we're hiking and they're super cautious as we were going through one area and I couldn't totally understand why they were so concerned and we came around a corner and looked back and we were hang like just on the top of a ridge like this. No that way. went down 200 feet um, straight into water. So then we really understood why they had us out there with them. Um, that it's those things that just you always remember them because they're such a unique experience. And I would say for myself and the kids, we are anxious and excited to get down to Patagonia and see some of the work that they've done so far. Um, it's really fun for us to be able to be out there with him at different points in time. All right, so next one. Uh, question for Willie. How did you get into trail building? Did you have a post-secondary education at all? Also, what was your favorite part of going to Argentina? It looks like a beautiful region. Yeah, how I got into trail building. I did my Eagle Scout project in Pro State Park in Trumplow, Wisconsin, putting up benches on the trail system out there. A lot of them are still exist, all the recycled plastic benches I put in. Um, and that's kind of how I got into it. That snowballed into working for the Wisconsin DNR at a high school, which led to working for a nonprofit uh, state run conservation corps, which led to me traveling all around the country working for conservation corps which led for me to like, I, this is what I want to do. So I contacted the only trail builder I knew at the time and me and him partnered together and six other people and got a business going on the East Coast, which ran for six years, still up and running. But I wanted to get back to the Midwest to bring my knowledge of trails back here and um, started Great Lakes Trail Builders in 2008 and just been able to watch it grow um, into exactly what I you know, want it to be right now, which is be able, gives me uh, time with family gives me time teaching people, gives me time doing construction and design work, which is pretty awesome. 
Um, so post-secondary education, I have an associate's degree in business management, um, which, you know, has played out to be, work out well for sure. Um, also, favorite part of going to Argentina, it, the, I mean, the beauty is like pinch me all the time, like, wow, I'm working here. <laughs> Like, like, wow, I am getting paid to be here and just walk around and decide, like, which beautiful thing and where I want to take people. And, like, it was just, like, constant, like, things like, this is what I'm doing. Like, usually, you know, once a day I'd look to my buddy and we one of us would be like, yep, we're getting paid to be here <laughs> right now. And I was just like, I don't know, it's pretty awesome. You know, is you have that sense of a feeling when you're out in the wilderness that you might be the first person that's been in an area and having those sort of thoughts and feelings when you're out like and about is pretty awesome um, and super addicting. Um, the article we read was published in 2015. We heard you quickly mention bees in the virtual tour. So I was wondering if there's a city ordinance was ever passed and you now have your beehives in your yard or are they still on another property what are the sustainable actions do bees help with besides providing you with honey yeah um so good thing is be the city ordinance passed um put that on a link below and um we don't have them in the yard um katie's allergic to bees but she's super open having bees in the yard but our kids are super into checking things out so we have a three and a six year old and maybe next year or the following year they'll be old enough where they really understand and they won't, you know, try to play around with the hive. My son Liam, he's six. He's been helping me with the bees. We keep him outside of the city. It's about a half hour drive away. It's not ideal right now because we'd like to have him closer because it's really fun to watch the bees. Um, what we're looking at is potentially working with the Cane Street Community Garden to be able to put our bees there in the few, uh, maybe next year even. Um, they ha besides honey, I mean, honestly... Honey is kind of a waste product of the more valuable things that bees do, and it's pollinating. Bees, I think it's like one in three, like, food items are touched by, like, bees pollinating. Like, it's so important. Like, we've been able to see the bee population raise just around our yard by having, like, the prairie out back, by having the rain gardens out front, by having things. Like, we've been able to see more bees happen, which is really great. Um, okay, um, have the amount of chickens, uh, fluctuated over the years? What is the sustainable <laughs> amount of chickens to feed and tend to, to the family for a family of four? It's a good question. <clears throat> so the city of La Crosse allows you to have five chickens. Um, the amount has definitely fluctuated over the years because, uh, there'll be times when a chicken dies, um, and... There are certain times of the year that are best to get new chicks. So there have definitely been times when we've had fewer than five chickens, and then in the spring we'll get baby chicks again and um, start reintroducing them to the flock. What is the sustainable amount of chickens to feed and tend to for a family of four? That's a good question. Because we're bound to that um, five chicken limit, I would say for a family of four we could certainly have more chickens in order to meet the amount of eggs that we eat. But because we're limited to five, we just eat within that parameter. Um, right now we're in a period of time where they're molting, which means they don't lay any eggs and they all seem to do this at the same time. So there are definitely certain points throughout the year too where we just don't have eggs and then we just make do with other things to eat. Um, but I would say when the chickens are laying, we're getting probably four, yeah, four, four eggs, eggs a day. day. Um, so we tend to eat eggs and maybe every other day or every three days. All right. Have you considered the honeybees out competing native bees? Let's just start with that question. Have you considered the honeybees all competing native bees? Um, you have, but since we've moved here, we still see, the going on to the next one, we still see native bumblebees around our yard. Mm -hmm. um, so we're still seeing them around the yard. We don't have them here right now. And like the bee population is in a world of hurt right now. Mm -hmm. um, we've, um, so the, with the bees in a world of hurt, you know, it's... A good question. Um, we haven't seen the amount of native bumblebees in our yard go down, if not up since we've been here. So um, that could be a sign of it. Um, bees in the winter, um, keep the bees, we just uh, insulate them, put a little insulation around them. I make sure I don't really check them. I'll check them once more 
and then I'll just let them be through the winter. You want to make sure they have enough honey in the hive to be able to make it through the winter. So you can't deplete their honey supply because that's what they live in through the winter. Um, and then our problem with bees has been in the springtime. The freeze saw cycle is where we've lost most of our bees. Yeah. And what right now, currently, the amount is that 50% of all hives die over the winter right now. Yeah. It's a pretty significant amount. And I think the other thing, too, is the bees you buy you intentionally buy locally um, because some bees that are shipped from across the country, you do have some of that uh, competitive piece. But if you're buying local bees, they tend to uh, blend right into the, the local flora and fauna just fine. Mm -hmm. um, what else do you do to keep your soil healthy, nitrogen rich? And do you test your soil to ensure you're getting all the nutrients you need? Um, so I'll take this question here. Um, well, like I mentioned, so we use a compost, we uh, use ash, um, we use leaf mulch, and we use um, the comfrey. And a combination of all those are what we use just below our top soil, which isn't very thick here. We have super sandy soil too. Um, so we're never like, it's not like, and that's just what you kind of have in the city of La Crosse. Um, I do have a soil like um, dry and pH meter and de definitely check on that to make sure like if we're having challenges in areas, like I mean, I'll check the soil to make sure we are getting all the nutrients we need or I'm like, why isn't this working? Why isn't this working? Um, but great question. I'll give this one to Katie. How do you preserve your ketchup? Does it keep well in the fridge like store-bought? All right, so for ketchup, we've done a couple of things. We've canned it, and then this year we froze it. Um, I personally like the texture and taste of our ketchup more than store-bought, but I will say it is a different texture. Um, that store-bought is so creamy and smooth, and this has more of you know the fiber and bulk of the tomato in it. And I think that goes with pretty much everything that you're going to make at home. Um, a lot of times the reason store-bought stuff tastes a certain way is because of that processing and preservatives. You know, it's like if you make homemade bread, it's really fresh at first, but if you try to keep it for more than a week, it's going to get hard. The reason some of the store-bought bread is so soft continuously is because of the preservatives that are put in it. So I would say um, it is different, but for me personally, I have come to like the homemade food way more than the stuff that I end up buying at the store. Did you want to add anything nope. to that? All right, great. next question. How many different species of plants approximately do you have growing in your gardens? And we got this question after the tour. Do you remember? Gosh, I the... think it was in the 40s. Yeah, it was a lot. Um, that was just vegetable produce yeah. plants. Yeah. Yeah. Then we have, you know, fruit trees and bushes and vines. So we're probably looking around 50 or so that we plant around. Um, yeah, which has been great. And like, a, like a, a large amount of those are, you know, different varieties of tomatoes um, and a couple different varieties of basil. Do you plan on raising any live ch stock other than chickens? <laughs> I'm going to give this one to Katie because she's really psyched about another livestock. And then the bees are something that we're interested in bringing in the future. But Katie? I would love to have a little goat to move around the yard and eat the grass and the weeds and stuff. But I will tell you, I've read through that city ordinance and that is not an option right now. Um, if for some reason they change, I'd love to get a little, little miniature goat and put it out there. So... As of right now, we'll stick with the chickens and the bees. Yeah. It was something that Hillview Urban Agriculture Center, when they were still existing, tried to work with the city on. And they were coming up with trying to figure something on a five acre, which there isn't many five acre lots in the city to work with to begin with. But they were looking at something like that. How much food do you grow and harvest through the winter? Good question. Um through the winter, we're, we scale. We'll still go with kale. Like right now, our greenhouse is actually not doing too bad um, with this early cold shock that we had. And kale is something that we'll do through the winter. Inside, we do herbs. And I have a bunch of tomato and lettuce um, plants under the uh, lights in the basement um, growing right now. And kind of to go on to that, we will continue to grow stuff, but it's not going to be anything in comparison to being outside. Um, so we do the best that we can through the winter and then we eat off of what we grew in the summer. 
we do harvest usually a deer or two in the fall and that's processing and getting ready and that's all part of you know processing too mm -hmm. All right, you mentioned some starter plants that others can take from your front yard garden and grow themselves. What are some examples of these plants? Yeah, this year, I mean, we had um, we had tomatoes, we had basil, I think even threw a couple walnut trees that I had uh, <laughs> that came up this year. Um, kale plants, chives. Um, chives are really great. You know, we have some garlic chives and we have some just regular chives and those are nice because they keep coming back and it's crazy they whether it's me or Katie or the kids or even our dog loves to chew on the chive <laughs> plants um, which is which is great but that's one thing so we just have we have a little free library out front and then we also have just that we give away some of our excess plants because we have a hard time ripping plants out and just letting them lay there so all right are you still allowing tours during this time of COVID-19 I'd be interested in visiting um well Obviously, because of this class isn't on a tour, it's been challenging. It's in a, we, our daughter has um, had respiratory issues, a very young one, so we've been we've been on pretty much on lockdown right now. It's we'd be interested in doing something this spring, um, and maybe we could get something figured out with Margot, and we can talk about it for this spring. Right now isn't the greatest time to tour. It's kind of like the you know fall, everything's dying. It's great because you kind of get to see things in flux, but it's not like the best time of the year for the tour. Yeah, so as springtime comes, we'll keep in touch and maybe we can even figure out a smaller group or something to come out. So we definitely love to have you um, once things kind of even out a little bit. Do you ever grow too much food? If so, how do you distribute the extras, community donations, compost, etc.? That's a great question. Um, we really do process a lot. I mean, again, we're on a city lot, so... From what we can grow, we do try to preserve as much as we can um, and not overgrow on too much. But that being said, we do have extra and we give it to our neighbors, we give it to friends, we give it to family. Um, we try to just give as much as we can to people. Um, sorry, my phone is probably buzzing behind you. Oh, right up here. All right. So we try to give as much as we can to people. And again, it's that whole relationship building as well, too, is... Um, you know, if we have somebody watch our chickens, we just say, take the eggs, you know, those are yours. Take anything you want. Um, we have neighbors who will just come and pick some stuff out of our garden too. So anytime we have more than we need, we just give that away to people. Uh, any other specific or general advice for college students who eventually wish to grow their own gardens? Something you wish you would have known before starting to grow everything. You know, I think we've answered this question pretty well. So, um, unless you have anything you want to add, Katie? Um, is there anything you wish you would have known before you started growing? Um, no. I, well, besides what I mentioned before, like you can't plant things too close together. You're really going to cut into the yields of the plants by like planting things too close together. So like really like those, the recommendations on there for how deep to uh, plant the seeds, for how much to space mm -hmm. them apart, mm -hmm. like they're they're tried and true they're pretty solid you can again you can get things going more vertically um which we do around here but really like look at those i think that's a big thing yeah and we you know what we'll add a we'll email margo um a list of some of the books that we really really rely on for planning each year so that you can see that as well so all right i think we'll wrap up our second segment here and then uh we'll do our last segment in just a minute yeah sounds good see you guys in a bit bye <laughs> 